within an hour of time with us, you realize that they hate the way they look because of wound in junior high, some mean girl got to her, someone, someone made fun of this or that. And, 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 and the narrative began and the lie started. I'm really excited to have him on, share his wisdom, and he's just such a dear friend of mine. And so thank you, Ed, for coming on. My pleasure. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you into becoming a therapist? What's your story? <clears throat> My story um, uh, didn't actually start with uh, becoming a therapist. I think my story really began with my incredible struggle through elementary, junior high, and high school. Uh, never felt uh, like I, I, I could ever succeed in, um, in any of those arenas. In fact, I, I, think, I think my story begins when, when, it, when it's marked by a tremendous amount of failure and shame. That's mm -hmm. where my story started. And um, uh, struggled academically. Uh, and so I basically cheated my way through high school and got out of high school. When I got out of high school, I felt like I got out of prison because to me, it was an institution of shame, uh, an institution of rejection. And, um, and so I went and worked construction uh, for the next uh, seven years of my life. And, 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 the, and the whole time I was working construction, I, I, all, all I could think about was how in the world could I help kids, university, high school students that sucked in high school as bad as I did, who struggled as much as I struggled. And so that um, led me to, to, to start a, a charity, and through that charity, I, uh, I began to work with high school students. And um, I, that led me into places uh, where I was doing a lot of, a lot of communicating, a lot, of motivate, a lot of motivational talks. And after doing that um, uh, for about uh, 15 years, I then felt like it was time to leave the stage and pursue another uh, avenue of, of care and help. And so um, I, I, I went back to university to do a master's degree in psychology and, and when I was 40. And, um, and up until that time in my life, I, I focused primarily on um, high school students until 2007. Almost, almost exclusively high school students. But then I, um, I moved, moved to Kelowna in 2007. And with the intention of, of actually shifting my focus to helping university students. And uh, again, found myself really gravitating to those that just have so little self-worth, so li struggled so much. Uh, with identity uh, formation, identity crisis, um, that, uh, that it, it seemed like the most natural place in the world. Um, a really good friend of mine, uh, Ken Stober, established a Third Space Life Charity, and it was my great joy and privilege to be able to uh, uh, just come alongside, and, um, and, and, and as we were just helping people that were coming through the charity, the university, the student union at uh, UBCO reached out to us and said, could you give us some help uh, with uh, the, the overwhelming number of students that are struggling um, with mental, with their mental health. And that was the relationship that began with the, the University of British Columbia Okanagan. And that kind of brings us to today. Wow. And it's amazing that those high school years or those early years, like a word that was said to you, a word so painful, stuck with you. And that's where you went back to. 
like once you actually got out of there, you went back to that. And that's so true that often out of our, our deepest pain or, or our scars come our most effective impact. And that's just reverberated even to what you do as a therapist now. Um, can you speak to the power of the words or the story that we tell ourselves? Because I know you work a lot of narrative therapy and could you share kind of what, what that is? What is narrative therapy? Sure. Um, narrative, narrative therapy understands fundamentally that we are who we are from the inside out and that for the most part, we are interpreters. We rarely experience a moment for actually what it is. Rather, we interpret that moment. And we interpret that moment through the story often that we tell ourselves of who we are. And if that story is one of victimization, then every event in every room becomes a bit of a challenge for us. We play defense, we're protecting ourselves. We're... And so I think narrative therapy understands that um, what is going on the inside of you has an incredible influence on how you do and what you do, the things that you do, how you react and how you respond to your, your, your opportunities, how you act and how you respond to your circumstances. Wow. And, and it is so powerful. The stories that we tell ourselves are the stories that we integrate as part of us and then live it out. And, and I think that's so powerful because even when I first met you, that was, you know, just the, the type of care that you provided in third space charity and university of British Columbia and getting to bump into you there and just how you were able to speak life into me, into so many other people. And we have a saying on our team. So Ed and I get to now supervise these students, um, these graduate students who are trained to be, uh, registered clinical counselors and therapists and social workers and, and get to teach them how to do that. And they, they do our practice, their practicum with us. And it's so much fun. And we have a saying, be the person Ed thinks you are. And it is like, it's so empowering words at a strategic time. Um, can you share an example of maybe what narrative therapy looks like in real life? So, um, most of us don't even realize we, we have an internal narrative. Um, but I think it looks a little bit like this. So you, um, we, when, when we're children, especially, you know, we, kid, kid, kids are so intuitive. Um, they, you, you spend two days, three days in a room, even less, and, 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 and children will figure out very quickly who is cool and who's not. They figure out very quickly who is smart and who's not. And um, when I look back, I always knew I was one of the dumb ones. Um, but it didn't really bother me in the earlier grades because my best friends were dumb. And um, we, we weren't so smart in school, but we were pretty good athletes. And so we, we dominated on the schoolyard. And um, I figured kind of the universe had been fair. Um, but I remember uh, going into grade five and it was a new teacher and that teacher uh, called, gave, you know, took attendance and didn't call my name. And so I put up my, my, my hand and I said, you, you didn't call my name. And uh, the teacher uh, looked through a bunch of papers and he stood in front of me and he huffed at me. He huffed at me. I, how is it that I'm 62 and I still remember it like it happened yesterday? And he said, I didn't call your name because you're not in this class. You failed. Go back to Miss Murphy's class. That's where you belong. And I remember uh, I'm just, a, uh, I just started to bawl. I just started to weep. The shame was unbelievable. I'd been humiliated in front of my own tribe, my own herd. And so they took me out into the hallway and I was just un unconsolable. And um, then they put me in the front row of Miss Murphy's class. Now, 
as a kid, all you know is that this has been the most humiliating and, 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 and the most traumatic experience because your friends are moving on and you're not. And it wasn't until I was in my early 40s and somebody told me about internal narratives. In fact, I learned that while I was doing my master's degree. And, and, and I was at the first time in my life, I'm 41 years old, 42 years old, and I'm exploring my own internal narratives. And in doing so, I'm exploring the, 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 the very thing that I'm filtering most of my experiences through. And, um, and, I, and, and as I was exploring my internal narrative, the thought kept coming back to me, you, you, you're, you're the dumbest kid in this room. And I remember thinking that because I was the only one who failed. And because I was the only one who failed, I must be the dumbest person in grade four right now. And uh, it's amazing how uh, uh, a thought like that begins to pick up steam and works its way on the canvas of your imagination. And, and, and before you know it, um, it has become a core belief, a neuron that has formed that is absolutely substantial. It's, it, it's, it, 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 it's formed because of the amplitude of the emotion of shame and all of that goes on there. And, and here I am sitting in grade four and, 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 and it's begun. The narrative has begun and it's begun to do his work. Now we can't hold those painful thoughts uh, cognitively for very long because they're just too painful. They're too traumatizing. Yeah. And so what happens is those thoughts drop into our subconscious but they operate there like a base note. They are still filtering. We're filtering moments, experiences uh, of our lives through those, through that story. And so I, I, I cheated all the way through junior high and high school, maybe because it was hard for me and maybe because I had already just accepted the fact that I'm the dumbest guy in every room, right? What's interesting, Barb, is that um, once I started my charity, um, and I'm trying to help high school students, I found out that I'm a not I'm a pretty good communicator, and 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 doors began to open across the country for me to speak to high school students, and then doors started opening up all over Europe, Western Europe, then doors opened in other countries, and. And, and from the time I was in my mid-20s to the time I was 40, I, I spoke to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And I spoke on some big stages and some small stages. But it didn't matter. When I finished my talk and they were still clapping, I'd get off. I'd go to the back of the stage and I would just have this sigh of relief because I, I fooled yet another crowd. They didn't realize that the dumbest guy in the room was on the stage. And in so many ways, for all of the success I had in those years, I still felt like an enormous poser, an enormous poser. And you see, the, the only way the, 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 that core belief can also be called an unchallenged assumption. And the only way to be able to address that internal narrative is you have to, first you have to be able to identify it. And from where I was sitting at 42, I, it was a little bit of work, but I, I do distinctly remember having many of those internal conversations uh, with the reference to me being the dumbest person in the room. And um, which, which, by the way, meant every room was a threat. Right. Yeah. Anywhere you walk into. then Any, you know, Anywhere you walk into. Yeah. But, but we all have equipment, right? And I have a big personality. And, 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 and I can make people feel good about themselves. And so, and so, so I would be like, I'd be like a, like a dancing bear. I, I would come meet you. I would make you feel amazing about yourself, but it was never about you. I was protecting myself. I was protecting my own sense of poverty, my own sense of dumbness. I just didn't want you to figure it out. Not today. Because when, when, you, when, when, when you experience um, what I experienced, and, and I know that many people listening to this thing will say, you know, I experienced worse than that, buddy. You know, that's nothing compared. And I, and I, I defer. I, 
That's, that, that's entirely possible. But what I know is that when you experience pain, of sh the, the pain of shame, like I did that day, I, I made a vow. I'll never, I'll never feel that shame again. It's interesting. Um, uh, sometime later, my, I was walking home from school at lunch in grade uh, four, grade five. Which, folks, by the way, I, 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 I caught up to my class by Christmas. I got an award, Barb. That year, I got an award for the most improved student. But the damage was already done. And, and, and I limped for all those years in between because of an internal narrative. And I remembered walking home from school. And I'm, I got C plus on a, on a test. Trust me, that was a, an accomplishment for me. And my cousin kept bugging me to, to, to see what was on the paper because I folded it. I was holding it. It was going to show my mom. And finally, he, he, he relented. And I, 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 I opened the paper and I said, see, I, I, got, I got a C plus, man. I got a C plus. And he said, dude, you are the dumbest guy in our class. That was so easy. Everybody got an A. And so what happens is when, when a, a, a narrative or a story that I tell myself it drops down into the subconscious. Now I'm not challenging them. I'm looking for evidence to prove it's true. And Barb, you know this, we always find what we're looking for. And so every mistake you make, there it is. There's, there, there is, there's the evidence. You, 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 you don't do well here. You don't do well there. You, and, and, and now you have, Actually, this neural net, this belief system is now a six lane highway. And um, uh, so when I was at, in, 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 in grad school, I, I, I had to first I identified it. The second thing you do is you need a truth that is weightier than that truth. And you need to challenge it. You need to push up against it. And what I concluded uh, was that I did have intelligence and my intel intelligence was really around communication and it was around people. I, I, I have a pretty, pretty um, uh, high EQ. And so um, every time I began to feel the shame, which I think I was going to say this, once you feel shame once, it hurts. You feel it again. It's not like, oh, it, that one again. It's like to the 10th power. It's like, it's like, it's, it's multiplied. And then to the 10th power again. And I made a vow. I'll never feel that much shame again. I'll never let anybody feel, you know, make me feel that much shame. But this is the interesting thing is that um, you can, you can avoid that internal narrative, and avoidant behavior always supersizes our fear. It becomes it becomes a monster in the closet, really. And in when I was uh, in grad school, I, I simply began to declare out loud. And there are some things that you just got to say out loud because it, it triggers a different part of your brain. I just began to declare out loud. You know what? I'm not giving any more power to my grade five teacher to that moment in grade five. Um, I'm smart. I'm intelligent with people. I'm intelligent when it comes to um, communication. And, and that was all I had at the time. I mean, I, I, I wasn't trying to convince myself of that. Those two things I knew I had. And the more I challenged it, the more I challenged it, the more I challenged it. What I didn't know, but what I know now is that a new neural net is formed, a new synapse is formed. And the old one virtually has disappeared. And with the new uh, neural net, there's the, the shame is no longer an issue. It's not the, the thing that I avoid the most in my life. In fact, I'm quite comfortable with the fact that I'm a two-trick pony and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really ashamed of that. Wow. It sounds like by pushing up against it, challenging it with, like you said, a weightier thought, something that you tangibly could sense, you could feel emotionally into that you're good at, 
Like when I speak to these people and I see that positive change in there, something in me stirs, something in me comes alive and I can use that to then combat that shame. Cause shame, I think is the worst emotion to feel like it is just, it's hot, it's prickly, it's heavy. Like you can just sense it in your body and it sticks with you. And absolutely. It's like, I never want to feel that again. I have never to myself in any way, shape or form. So I don't. And what, I, what I've come to, to, to recognize um, when I'm listening and, I, and I'm inviting people to explore their, the, the story they tell themselves of who they are, it's always a story of not enoughness. It's always, and it's all, it almost always comes to us. It's almost like it's inserted in, in us when there's a wound or a failure or a disappointment. That's so true. And then it sticks um, like that, like you said, how it goes into the subconscious part of the brain. It's kind of like uh, Velcro, those negative thoughts tied to the emotional part of your brain. It's actually stored that way. And it sticks like Velcro. That's why it's so intense. And I mean, Velcro is not cement, luckily, but it can get really tough to un do it. And like you said, creating those new kind of neuro highways in your brain or that new thought pattern and that new story and telling it and telling it and telling it and telling it and then believing it and believing it, believing it is a process. I mean, it's doable though. That's the key that that's hopeful. It's interesting to me because um, the reason I think I, I, I love this modality is because um, those stories are more powerful than any mirror. Yeah. Uh, Barb, you and I know this. We work with uh, young adults. We work with university students, and and sometimes they will come into the office, and they're and they're incredibly attractive, both male and female. They're 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 they're, they're striking, you know. And within an hour of time with us, you realize that they hate the way they look because a wound in junior high, some mean girl got to her someone someone made fun of this or that and 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 the narrative began and the lie started and and before you know it they are actually believing what is going on in here more than the mirrors telling them it is so true. I, I would totally agree that most people's stuff or the stuff that we tell ourselves or wrestle with can really be boiled down to not enough in some way, I am not enough in some way. I'm not smart enough, thin enough, pretty enough, uh, successful enough, motivated enough, anything. I am not enough. So when you're sitting with people and you're, you're helping them retell their narrative, I guess, like you said, it's identifying it first. Like, where is that pain point? How do we challenge it? But what, what else do you do with them? What do you, how do you help them reframe their narrative? Um, I, I, I do this little thing that I, I ask them what makes them beautiful. And you cannot imagine how uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> Ask, can, can, can you actually hold authentically live in without judgment your own beauty can you move around within your own beauty what makes you beautiful and most people can barely come up with one thing yeah. first of all they hate the word yeah <laughs> and i'm almost always very intentional about using that word even with guys yeah um, and so it's identifying what, 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 what makes them a, a beautiful human being. And when, 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 when they can identify that, now you can start reinserting that back in the, in the backstory. Because you, 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 I'm, I'm going to guess you are always gentle with people if that's part of your beauty today. Um, now let's re-look at that story and see that uh, somehow you found your way back to grade five within the space of four months. How'd you do that? Um, well, maybe I, I could be stubborn and I can be tenacious. All right, that's beautiful, Ed. That's beautiful. And we help them identify. And so it, it's really when, when you rewrite the story and the story is one of beauty and we withhold judgment on some of the areas where we've got challenges and blockages and and gaps, 
um, all of a sudden uh, we, we can rewrite the story. And that's part of narrative therapy is that you're the author of your story and you can write the story and you have agency in that story. It's not like the, the story was handed down to you. Um, you can actually find beauty in, in, a, in, a, in a chapter of your life that looked really, really uh, ugly. Oh, that's so redemptive. That is really, so, I love that exercise. So what do you do if someone, you know, they're coming to you, there is a lot of shame or there's just grappling with self-worth and they say, um, I don't know, nothing, nothing makes me beautiful. How do you help kind of mine that out of them? That's, that's work. Um, <laughs> partly, um, I think it is. Now, this is when I'm pretty comfortable with my own essence, my own edness, my own wh wh whatever, whatever I am. Um, and I'm quite comfortable with that and, and I honor it. You know, you naturally position yourself to see beauty in others. And sometimes um, you, they, they have to borrow my eyes and they have to borrow my perspective for a little while. When I say to them, are you kidding? I see this in you every time you and I sit down. I see that. You know, Barb, you, 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 how often you, you say, you know, sometimes a client needs to borrow our words um, our opinion of them because theirs is so low. Sometimes they need to just borrow our eyes and um, and let and see themselves the way the way somebody who who can see them, you know, um, for who they are. Yeah, I love that, and it's amazing too. Just the correlation of you know early on that pain, that shame, that grade five teacher, and somebody else's external words external voice that then became your internal voice and part of your narrative. And then the healing process of say counseling in this approach where someone's safe and trusted like a counselor, maybe a family member, a friend or spouse or something like that. They're positive, they're empowering, their life giving external voice can help change that narrative to become a new internal voice in someone's life. And that's why the relationship, in my opinion, between the therapeutic relationship is absolutely critical for that to happen, where there has to be so much trust and there, there has to be that has to be such a safe place so that you, you, you're, you're, you're willing to trust another voice where before the other voices, they, they hurt you, they they devastated you, you, you know, and so you, and, and here you are, and, and, the, and there's just so much responsibility on the therapist um, to, 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 um, to steward that, that moment, to redeem that moment whenever they get the chance. Yeah. And how would you say, I mean, that's, that's such an amazing process and approach the therapeutic relationship, and you've been doing this for a long time. How do you think therapy has changed? Like, is this a new approach or modality? Is this kind of been around for a while? How have you seen therapy progress? I think it's evolving constantly. I think therapy is moving away, at least in my opinion, at least from the real clinical um, white coat style uh, therapy uh, to uh, one where there is uh, uh, a, a safe, empathetic space, uh, a relational work. Um, I think that there's, there, there's a lot more ways, even, you know, things like walk therapy uh, is, has been proving, proven itself, even in our team to be very effective. Um, and so I think that for there to be that, 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 that human connection, um, that, that becomes a, a really important right now. When I was trained, um, that, that wasn't, we, we were taught much more clinical counseling as it were. And, um, and I think that people are responding much uh, 
in, in, a, in a kinder, more responsive way uh, to, to newer, newer modalities. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, it seems like change happens um, the most powerfully in a relationship. Absolutely. So you would say kind of therapy is heading more towards even more of that relational safe place type of way. I think so. Yeah. I, I actually think so. You know, that the context for, for change it needs to be safety, needs to be trust. Yeah. Yeah. I so agree with that. I think that's so true. And, and you do see it like of, of just, how relationally different people are. There's just some people that you just want to be around too, or they just kind of ooze this calm or acceptance and, and that's who you want to be around. And I think in, in therapy, if you can come and just be present with someone and, and hold space for that, it is so powerful because the rest of our world's nuts and it's busy and chaotic and frantic. And to be able to really just hold that sacred space is so beautiful. Yeah, I think that I think that the one thing that I've noticed as I'm growing and again, uh, I just uh, I just flow and operate in what I know. But uh, I think it's so important for those who who are in this work know how to be present with themselves, because how how is it that you if you can't be present with yourself, how how can you possibly be present with somebody else and, and and what are you bringing to the session if not your authentic self and um, those are important things I think that that uh, that I think about a lot so when someone comes in to see you and kind of you know maybe they don't know exactly what narrative therapy or the even the story that they're telling themselves is or that core belief how do you help kind of shepherd them along in that? Um, do you jump right into it? Do you kind of just uh, allow it to organically happen slowly? What does that look like? Um, I don't necessarily use narrative therapy every day in every session. I probably use CBT, um, you know, pretty consistently as well. Um, honestly, it, it depends on the client. It depends on their needs. Um, it depends kind of, and, and, and the reason that uh, maybe I find myself operating in the modalities I do is because we, we work with university students primarily. We, we, we give away thousands of hours uh, to, to caring for, uh, you know, post-secondary students who are right in that middle of that, the, that long extended adolescent journey in, in which they are trying, you know, identify who they are, that self-discovery, that identity formation is such a big part of that. And so instead of waiting to their 40, I really want to start introducing them to the concept um, and they can wrestle with it. Um, then they know how to wrestle with it as they, as they kind of grow up. What would you say are some just solid building blocks to have a healthy narrative in someone's life. Like for, if you were to say, okay, if kind of more the uh, preventative measure rather than reactionary, what are ways to have a healthy narrative? I, I think, I think that to have a healthy narrative, you, you need to have some healthy people in your life. Yeah. Um, I think you need to have some healthy relationships in your life. Um, I, I think you need to um, be affirmed uh, by your work, in your work, by the things that you're setting your hand to, um, the opportunity to operate in your strengths and in your, um, in the things that you're naturally gifted at. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you um, probably need a really high level of self-awareness. I think a grow, let me say this, a growing level of self-awareness. Yeah. And then, and then uh, really good, like what informs you as a human being? What are you reading that informs your identity? What are you reading that informs your worth? 
you know, where are you getting that from? So to be really intentional about those things. Yeah. Oh, that's great. There's a, those are a lot of different types of quote unquote external voices, like what you're reading, who you're around, what you're doing, even hobbies or work to then that really does um, infiltrate and, and guide that internal voice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, Ed, before we, we close today, I'd love to hear what brings you joy about being a counselor? What brings you joy about your job? Um, uh, I, I love the opportunity to leave somebody just a little bit better than I found them. I really do. And when somebody takes one step closer to, 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 to their, to walking and dancing within their freely in their own identity, that really, really, that's a game name. That's a game changer for me. And, and I think I'm an encourager by nature. And so it, it actually in, in my own way gives me the opportunity to, to uh, inspire gives me the opportunity to encourage and maybe it gives me definitely gives me the opportunity to care. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to be a safe place for another human being, which I love. Um, yeah. I, I, there's just so many things about counseling that I like that I love. Um, and I suppose that, and sometimes I think I was, um, you know, I was, I'm, I'm wired for this. This is the most natural thing in the planet for me to do. Yeah. Oh, you definitely are. You help shape so many people's narratives. I know you have mine and yeah, you're just so gifted at it. And thank you so much for coming on today. And it's such great tidbits of wisdom and part of your story and pain, but coming out of that to then reflect back on it and retell it in a different way through a strength-based perspective, even being in control of that narrative, kind of even paying attention to what external voices or things are coming in at our internal voice, paying attention to that. And I just think that's so insightful that a lot of us don't even pay attention to it. So thank you so much for just illuminating that for us and coming on today. My pleasure, Barb. It's always my pleasure to have a chat with you. Oh, I likewise. <laughs>